ago. Um, so I've entitled it, this is a provisional title for my thesis. I haven't decided the final title, but conviviality, conv um, commodity, conviviality, and connection, an interdisciplinary look at the Scottish seaweed industry uh, from the 17th to the early cent uh, 20th centuries. So uh, as I said, this is you know looking at you know what's happened in the past. And how is this uh, how is this an interdisciplinary? So this commodity conviviality and connection is is a way to to bring these different elements of history, archaeology, and heritage together. And uh, <laughs> so in terms of archaeology, um, it's a seaweed industry is a, a, an industry that lives very leaves very little evidence. Um, so the main uh, objective of this part of the PhD is to recognize the built remains of the industry and the landscape. For example, kelp kilns, drying walls, kelp stores, ending platforms, paths and roads, and so forth, infrastructure, as it were. And the history is not just examining the documented history as well as the oral histories, but also environmental history. So environmental history is a relatively new discipline. So this explores the story of human exploitation of the natural world and the impact that uh, human activity has had on the landscape. For example, going from uh, the history of hunting and grazing agriculture to mining, transportation, industrialization, through to urbanization. So all these things. And then heritage, um, so it is look, which is looking at the built, not just the built or tangible heritage as our, the archeology span and the material culture does, but the so-called intangible, such as stories, songs, poetry, music, remembrances, knowledge that's been passed on or skills, rituals, expressions, you know, this sort of legacy um, and this is sometimes called the living natural heritage. So to start off with, with, with seaweed, here we have phonig femming, which is an abundance of seaweed. Now this is from, uh, it's a prayer or a, a charm asking for an abundance of seaweed from the Carmina Gadelica that was collected by uh, Alexander Carmichael at the end of the 19th century. So this shows the importance of seaweed to coastal communities in these islands, um, particularly Great Britain and Ireland and the outlying islands, like Alex speaking. And the relation to seaweed uh, was different for our ancestors. And it wasn't seen as a weed or as a slimy thing to avoid on the, <laughs> on the shorelines, uh, but it was provided food in, in a couple of ways it, by eating it or using it as a, as a fertilizer, a manure on the land. And it was also used as medicine and fodder for the animals. Um, it was a big part of our uh, agricultural history. And the use as a fertilizer is thought to go as far back as the Neolithic, and it was used all over Scotland. Uh, the bio, uh, biologist uh, from the 17th century, John Hay, noted in his travel journals through Scotland, of uh, people, the farmers in East Lothian using it on their on their farms, on their <clears throat> and both Irish and Scottish Gaelic poetry and songs. It is always as is femming, um, and there's many names in Gaelic, both in Irish and Scots Gaelic, for seaweed. Probably as many as there are Latin names. Uh, the scientific names, maybe even more because there's so many different dialects for even one type of seaweed. Uh, Martin Martin, uh, the traveler from uh, travel writer from Sky at the seventh in the seventeenth century, noted different uses at the end of the seventeenth century in his tour of the Western Isles. So seaweed ashes used to lubricate threads for spinning or sewing, and salts from the ashes were used in cheese making in North Uist. So it goes, it's an important part of the communities in the first place. So why research 
the, the seaweed industry in particular. So this industry was an important part of uh, the economy and life of Scotland, in Scotland for over 200 years in the post-medieval period. And it connected parts of rural Scotland with a fast changing uh, global society, uh, economic and cult cultural developments that were going on, namely uh, capitalism. And the remains in the landscape can be seen, but is little study and the sites are vulnerable to erosion and with this and, and rising sea levels. So, and also you can see here, there are only these three uh, books that have been written about the industry. So we've got kelp making in Orkney that was in the early eighties from uh, William Thompson, uh, a little a booklet written in Gaelic about the industry and this huge book I have managed to get a hold of it's French, it's from Brittany, the Gaumonier, and that's it. And so the commercial exploitation is once again, as I mentioned just, in the, just before the talk started, uh, is a growing sector and it's important to reflect on its past impact, both socially, uh, economically, but most importantly, environmentally. So these three pictures are uh, symbolic of the three, what I would call the three phases of the seaweed industry, the modern industry. So we have kelp fragments, um, which is uh, showing as the earliest period for the alkali extraction for, uh, what was it, for, for alkali, to, for glass making and soap making, gunpowder, uh, potash. And then we have here uh, seaweed, a picture from the end of the 19th century, maybe early 20th century, uh, extract uh, from Orkney burning, uh, burning seaweed for kelp. And kelp is this product here, not the seaweed. And, and then here we have uh, a uh, gentleman raking some seaweed up uh, with a big tractor behind him. This is for the algae, it's sort of the modern industry. Um, this is in, in uh, Kyo's here on Lewis. So, so the, the earliest part of the industry uh, started with, I think in the late, in the end of, end of the 17th century in Scotland. Uh, it was about maybe about the middle of the 17th century. It began in Normandy in France. It spread to Cornwall and the Scilly Isles first, and then it gradually spread throughout Britain and, and Ireland eventually, uh, with the Orkney Islands being the first island uh, communities that had the, where the industry really spread, and that was where the main industry happened was in Orkney. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, beginning in 1722, and so, and then the the demise of this industry uh, was about 1830s uh, with a repeal of the Salt Act in the 1820s, and then more and more cheaper uh, exports could be had, and then also the the discovery of the LeBlanc method for the extraction of soda from salt, just normal table salt. Uh, was much more efficient, I suppose you could say, uh, and economically uh, feasible. So that declined, and in its place became the discovery of iodine in 1811 by Coutois, um, a French scientist trying to see if he could get, uh, well, it was, it was, I think it was for more for, for, uh, Gun, not gunpowder, but for, for munitions out of, out of kelp, not just gunpowder. And he discovered <clears throat> this sort of vapor coming out of the kelp uh, that he was using. Um, this was iodine. So this was, this was an industry for not just for pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical use, say in the treatment of goiter or as a uh, antiseptic, but it was also used in the uh, new industry of photography, and this, this industry lasted until 1937. 
Alginets right into the 20th century. And, and then of course the Alginets began in the 1930s and, and it's co continued to a degree, uh, but there's also is more, much the modern industry, we have this leads to the modern industry to a more broader usages and there's always new uses, new, new um, scientific developments for the use of seaweed, but I won't, I'm not researching this modern phase, the post-war phase, but it's just a, just a by the by, this is, <laughs> this is the, the seaweed industry. Okay, so the, so I'm looking look mostly at the first two uh, phases. So the first phase of the alkali extraction, the rock weeds uh, were the types that were used. So this Ascophyllum uh, nodosum, uh, they're, uh, they're basically bladder racks, grow on rocks right in the, the, on the shore, on, on rocks. So we have Feming Vuya, uh, Feming Robach or Vuyknoch, depending on where you're from, and Feming Yu, black seaweed, and which is a, a sawtooth or a toothed rack. These are really, really high uh, in in alkali, and there's a there's a lot of other leather, a lot of other uh, elements in them and compounds, but that those are the most important for for glass making, as well as soap boiling, and laminaria digitata, or the tangles as it's called in some places, um, stav and gallic, and this was used for iodine, and then later on. Is very high in alginic acid for the alginates, the thing that thickens food, for example. So, in Scotland, this is the number of sites that have been uh, identified so far. Um, so, we've got the Canmore sites in yellow and the Scape Trust uh, Coastal Zone Assessment sites in red. And this is not complete. You can see bits of the coastline here. There's big gaps here. Um, so for example, the Murray Coast uh, hasn't really been, uh, they've only just started doing the coastal zone assessments with Escape Trust. So hopefully uh, with some of the work I'm doing, although my work isn't to, isn't to do the entire coastline of Scotland, <laughs> It's to be able to, one of my outcomes is to be able to uh, clearly identify sites. So if somebody's going to do a coastal zone assessment, they know what, they'll know better what they're looking at. So hopefully, uh, hopefully in the future, this we'll see more uh, sites along here or some of these sites that, oh, maybe this is a kelp site. No, this is actually a kelp. This is a pit. For, for composting seaweed and not actually kelp burning sites. So some of some of those, sometimes there has been a confusion over the word kelp, kelp as a product versus kelp as a seaweed. So when I'm saying kelp, I mean the product in this talk and not a type of seaweed, which that, that name came much later. <clears throat> okay, so looking at my research approaches, I'll just not go to dwell too long on this, um, so the commodities conviviality. So it's how am I going to, make to bring these three uh, aspects together? So it's my research approach. So looking at commodities. So commodity is the product, and by looking at a commodity chain analysis and then the sort of commodity networks, um, it's going. I'm, I'm looking at the process from harvesting the seaweed looking at the individual uh, making the seaweed and their material needs in order to produce the uh, produce the kelp. So we goes on to burning it, um, to storing it, shipping it to markets, and then finally selling the product onto glass and soap makers. And then you finally have an end consumer. So this comes from world systems theory. So connecting the, the individual to, to the wider world, to so the, the micro to the macro. In other words, the, the landscape uh, archaeology 
which is the conviviality. Uh, so I'm looking at the, the interaction between both human and non-humans in the landscape. So this idea of conviviality comes from Ivan Illich. He's a philosopher uh, from Austria. Uh, and he wrote in his a book called Tools for Conviviality. Um, so what is this thing? This is the autonomous and creative intercourse among persons and the intercourse of persons with their environment and the individual freedom realized in personal interdependence and as such an intrinsic ethical value. So what is this in practice? This will involve looking at rhythms. So for example, uh, tidal rhythms, uh, time clock, so time was, working to time was brought in in the 18th century. You had to be up by a certain time. Uh, and there was time, uh, seasonal, dip, um, seasonal rhythms as well. Uh, and, and looking at how, how the humans, and when I'm saying non-humans in the landscape, that's like the soil, the air, the wind, the seasons, and so forth, everything work together. So when something's convivial or not convivial, it's, it's we've heard about environmental tipping points or how the world uh, at the moment in terms of climate change is at a tipping point. So in terms of this uh, this industry, I'm looking at tipping points because uh, in many areas, there were tipping points. It's like the scale of, say, collecting the seaweed where it's a sustainable activity and everybody has a choice and agency to participate in this to where it is no longer convivial. It is a, There's a tipping point where it's not healthy. They don't have agency. Um, they don't have the freedom to choose. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a way. <clears throat> and then finally, bringing these together with connections. So I'm, look, I'm looking at individuals, the communities, the regions, how people move through the landscapes, uh, new paths, new roadways, seaways, and, and so forth, uh, connections between uh, from, from these little islands to, to big markets to, to the wider world. So that's just a <laughs> kind of my approach in a nutshell. So now um, going on to how am I doing for time? Just before I get <laughs> you've you've got thirty five minutes max. Okay. Left. Okay. Great stuff. So <clears throat> now going on to sort of looking at the process. Uh, let me find my page here. Uh, so we're looking at gathering the seaweed, and this, the, like I said, this is the part of this is the part of the process that doesn't leave archaeological evidence. Um, there's some material culture, such as heather ropes and these tooth sickles, which were used to to cut. And so what I have found, um, I found this. Poem here from the uh, from here in back the, the back district uh, on how they used to make uh, heather that they take ropes of heather or uh, to make what they called a mish, which is uh, it's more like a, a square gridded raft. Okay, you see this gentleman Irish gentleman here. It's kind of a square shape, and it was in a grid, and it could be towed by a boat. And so they, they either did that or they can make these huge circles and then throw the seaweed into the circle and get, drag that ashore. So this particular poem, which I'm not going to read out or go through, um, just illustrates the process of going out, <clears throat> going out on the, on the spring tide and everybody had their part had they had particular jobs that they did somebody was in charge of the of the the yole or that has a yole, yole here a yola uh somebody had somebody got the got a hold of the ropes and um and and they're all sharpening their their they mentioned the corn here which is the sickle and uh just to go out and cut the they were obviously going to to some offshore rocks to to cut these 
cut to cut the seaweed, the femingu, the the serrated rack, and uh, so this was basic. You know, so they could pull it back to shore to put into their their uh, their their lazy beds to for their potatoes. But it's still the same. It's still the same technology, as it were, whether you're gathering it to to manure your land or uh, to for the for the burning of uh, seaweed for kelp. So there's one little story here. I guess this bar is in the way. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can get to it here. Oops, let's come back here. I'm just going to play this little. There it is. So this is you can get to see this. I'll play a little clip from this. In fact, so I Hopefully, gives you an idea what the experience of people is like to cutting. Um, well, in terms of the uh, for the kelp industry for the alkalis, the cutting didn't begin until the summer in order that they could dry it. Whereas he talks about he preferred drying it, cutting it in the in the winter, because he was working for his working for ASCO in in the uh, in newest. Uh, and and uh, so it's easier to cut actually in the winter. Oh, cold. <laughs> okay. So now moving on to <clears throat> how to recognize the actual kelp processing sites. So for the alkali uh, period, the earlier period, especially when they were still using oval pits, um, <clears throat> Kathy talked about this in her pre in her talk before with Nosas. Um, so they're oval, oval or, or round pits, and they're very ephemeral in certain ways. You may just think, oh, this is just a bit of, bit of a hollow in the ground. 
so here's here's one here at Aileen Ago at Calbost in Lewis. There's three three uh, pits, and I've got I've got a little survey drawing of uh, myself and my daughter did up of that last year. So there's three pits and the remains of a salting house <clears throat> there. So in the winter they would salt fish, and in the winter they would uh, in the summer they would uh, burn seaweed for the kelp. Uh, so you can see one, two, three, right, right, right together. These sort of oval or round pits, sometimes turf built up on one side or the other. And this is all over the Koigach. And Kathy uh, as, and Kevin, we did this, when did we do this? We did this in July, 2021. Was it July? Yes, it was. Um, <clears throat> at Garvey Bay. So there was a lot of these pits in Garvey Bay. And I went again uh, in May uh, to Garvey, went all the way to Ruachon, and there is even more up, up along there, um, but just all around the Koigach in different places. Uh, you see storm bars and away from settlements. That's another thing. These The uh, processing sites are away from settlements because of the stench. Um, it's 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 just so they tend to be quite in remote places. So you can see here one, two, three, four, and that was just on one half of the beach. <laughs> and and then here is it just looks like a bit of a hole uh in in uh in Orkney. So they can be really difficult to, to spot. You know, they they could be just rather shallow because they've been infilled, maybe. So the best examples I've seen have been around the Koigach. And then <clears throat> drying walls. Um, there are loads of them, maybe even better built up in, in, uh, in, um, in Orkney. But here's some I've seen around. Uh, so here's Old Dorney. You just see these really super rough walls. They were just thrown together. Um, it's just so they could quickly dry, just, just a little bit higher up. Oh, again, on the storm beaches there. Um, and this is something Kathy and I saw. It was all covered in bracken. And on the uh, on Canmore, it said a teardrop enclosure. And I visited in May. And it's, it, there's a kelp kiln just below this. And it's like, this is, and it's open at one end. And it's just, I think it's another drying wall. It's just as rough. And then here on uh, the Isle of Lewis at Galson. South Galson, a huge processing site, lots of dry trenches and some some round kilns, but mostly trenches and uh, a bothy or two. So it's a huge site. So there's again, it's just roughly thrown together. Uh, we've got another way. Uh, it's early seaweed farming. They're talking about seaweed farming nowadays, uh, and it was done in the 18th century. So especially if they wanted to, to have uh, a lot more supply than they had naturally. You can see sort of these shapes, these sort of kelp grids. Um, the two of these are in Sky Portree, um, Isle Ornsay and Slate, and on Dorlin Eriska. I think that's somewhere in Argyle. So there's loads of these on Canmore. And of course, there was a from the uh, end of the 18th century with the Highland Society, um, and Kathy mentioned the, this in her talk as well. So people wrote essays and they also had competitions for best kelp making. So there was a development and able to control the heat a bit better. They began, instead of just uh, sort of shallow, shallow pits, uh, circular or, or oval pits, they began to make sort of these double lined uh, trenches, so really um, quite a bit longer, maybe about six feet. This one was about six feet long. It wasn't as long as, say, uh, the ones in Tyree for iodine extraction, or this one here in Brittany. This one has the one in Brittany has kind of baffles, but it's so they could control the heat uh, a bit better. And now the difference there's a difference in burning for iodine. So with alkali they wanted to keep the heat up high and to, it goes into a moist clay 
and and then it's just full of full of all this all the alkali salts it has that kind of blue tinge uh, and with the iodine extraction, they didn't want it to go so hot because they didn't want the uh, iodine to evaporate. So they really needed to control the heat. And I, I can't really explain how, <laughs> how that works with my chemist. <laughs> but uh, yes, there was uh, Stanford and in, in, uh, in Glasgow who, who had a big factory on Tyree. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So you can also, uh, part of the infrastructure is buildings that are associated with uh, the kelp industry. So one going back to the 18th century, it's now an arts center, uh, is the kelp store. So it was a place to store the kelp once it was finished, to keep it dry and out of the rain until it could be collected for shipping. And then there was a seaweed factory, uh, Middleton and Tyree, for making iodine there rather than having to ship it all the way to, to Glasgow. And that was demolished in 1941 and now is part of the runway, <laughs> the RAF runway. So we've got, that was the North British Chemical Company. And there's one, um, one song I found that was uh, associated with this, I'll uh, play that. Um, Pit loads here. No pit loads. So it takes a little bit longer. <laughs> it doesn't load. I might just skip this. Oh, it might play. Okay. Just play a, a little bit of it. So this song, uh, which a couple of songs that I found associated with the seaweed industry tend to be rather humorous and satirical. Um, so this one is um, Here Without a Croft and a Boat. Uh, it's the name of the song. And he mentions, um, it says, do you know the Harry Graves? Harry Graves were, was a famous gold di uh, digger. Um, who are toiling away for Sleven, dragging tangles from the high water mark, a groat is all their pay. So uh, so he, he's making fun of the people that are working, burning kelp, working, slaving away at the seaweed factory for just a, maybe about 4p is what a groat was, a pay, price paid for a certain amount. Um, so he, he might be with he might be without a, a croft or a, or a boat, but he's a lot happier than they are. Um, so Sleven was the manager of the kelp works in Middleton, uh, known as the glossary. Um, the stems of the ore weed uh, would be uh, measured with a rod and their value set against provisions in the company shop. So they would go along, you know, I've gotten, I, I'm get, get all these things because I'm working in the kelp. So, 
So uh, both kelp bothies, um, you can see, I've saw more of these in the Koi Gok. Um, so at Reef, uh, the north end of the, the Loch of Reef, there's a storm beach, several, uh, several again, several uh, pits. But there's also, and drying walls, as well as a bothy. So um, it, was, it was a nice wee processing site. And it's the same thing at Old Dorney. There's a couple of bothies there, lots of drying wall. There's a drying wall right there. Um, well, Kathy knows this site really well as well. So, you know, several, several um, pits there. And, and of course, Kathy and I were here at Garvey. And this is possibly it's a flattened area. We could see the outline of some sort of structure here. Is it a bothy or is it for storage? Who knows? Uh, it's ephemeral, whatever it was. Maybe it was uh, a building made of turf. Uh, you know, they're they're you know they very often a lot of these these structures if they're by the shore and and uh, some archaeologist or Canmore calls it a sheiling. It's maybe not a sheiling. It may be uh, a kelper's body. If you, but if you see other evidence of uh, processing it, it, it may be that it that it's uh, indicative of a site. You'll see tracks getting to work. So there's a well-worn track going out to Garvey Bay and people to get to the beach, but it's, it's you know, and then it's going all the way up to, there's a path going all the way up to Ruachon, where there's another huge processing site, and, and then going all the way through to Achnahard, um, along that part of, uh, of the Koigach. So people had to get to work, whether, you know, just even if they were staying there for six weeks, they, they needed a good, good, good path to get to and from uh, work the access. And it's the same in Calbost and the Isle of Lewis. Lewis, this was a, one of the few villages that was resettled for the purpose of kelping. Um, there wasn't that sort of move from west to east uh, as was seen in South US and North US during the kelping boom years to uh, set up new kelping villages. Um, but this is one of the few uh, set up in the 18, about the 1880s. So the center of the village is here and this track still is really well worn. Uh, the village was basically depopulated by 1970, but the track's still very clear going to, to Eilanaga where the, price, uh, the processing site is. And as you can see, it's well away from many houses. And other types of infrastructure you might be seeing around. So here at Old Dorney is a really wide boat slipway right behind the processing site. So you would drag in the wee boats, nice and maneuverable, drag it up here, get your, or uh, probably the best at, on high tide to drag it in. Um, Old Dorney is such a fantastic estuary for growing seaweed, but you know, it wouldn't be just enough for the, all of the Koi Gach, but um, certainly it's just what a lovely, it was a lovely slipway, just very convenient for this site. And it's much safer. The other side is, is just, that boulder be, uh, bouldery, storm beachy place. And here we have uh, an example in Uig, uh, Loch Rogue, and Lewis. And so nowadays it's a very, very quiet, you know, peaceful place. In the 18th century, it was industrialized either with a fishing or with kelp in the winter or kelping uh, in the summer. So this this Uig was the this whole district and, and Carloway uh, was the main uh, production site for kelp uh, for Lewis in the 18th century. Um, and so we have an example. I went on a coastal zone assessment uh, in in uh, July 2021 with Escape Trust around Kalanish, just around this wee bit of coast here. So in the 18th century, um, George Macaulay, he was a taxman for Linshatter here and Kalanish. And he was also the kelp overseer for the entire Seaforth estate in the 18th century. He made so much money, he 
he got a he got a house in in uh, storing away. It's now the Crown Inn, <laughs> and so he would go ahead, uh, go maybe before the the, the uh, before the season started. He would inspect the shores. He would say, "You're going to cut here, or you're going to cut here." Uh, so you wouldn't cut the same place every year. The, if you cut one year, you leave it for th two or three years for it to regrow. So he would decide where to cut and how much was going to be cut. He would make an estimate and he would send that on to uh, Sir John Ingalls in uh, Edinburgh, who was the kelp merchant for the Seaforth estate. And based on that, he would, uh, Sir John Ingalls would arrange insurance and, um, and, the, the type of ships that would be had the correct tonnage to to take it away, so the insurance wasn't just, it was not just for bad weather but privateers because there was a problem with these privateers coming up uh, in the 1780s coming up from Dunkirk and taking uh, cargoes hostage with their with their captains and demanding ransom for the cargo because they knew they were easy prey all these uh, these kelp ships, so it was a type of piracy. So here at Calish Stones, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure uh, just around around that that bay here. A lot of infrastructure associated with kelping. So there was in this little red spot here, there is this cart track going straight into the bay to a slipway uh, right into the seaweed, and it goes right along the shore, all uh, alongside the shore, down to the loading prop platform at the promontory there's that there's the loading platform and to there so they would load it on these wee boats and they would take it to lit these two little one of two islands for processing for drying and to for burning so it's vuyavuk and uh no it's vuyavor and vuyavuk so uh, big and small. So they both of these had deep enough sort of bays for boats to come in that were heavily laden with seaweed or for takeaway kelp. And once it was processed and burnt, um, it would be brought here to Loch Drovenish for it to be weighed by uh, the ground officers who also acted as superintendents uh, to be weighed and shipped. And they would get... Uh, paid for that. And let's see, there was a little note. I'll have to find my note about that. <clears throat> uh, the, let's see. Oh, yes. So, yeah, the overseer, there's a thing about <clears throat> um, the overseers cared more about quality because sometimes the, the quality of the, they were paid by weight. The, the kelpers were paid by the weight of what they made. Um, so sometimes it was adulterated with stones and sand and the overseers, if they thought there was too much, they would, uh, there was one particular one, uh, Donald Monroe, who would unceremoniously dump the kelp into the sea at Loch Drovenish. So, uh, there was, somebody was asked, was he a good man? I think this may have been in the 1888, um, crofters, uh, does it the, Conditions of the Croft, uh, the Napier Commission. So in your dunya ma a hana dog roar. She a yinches shin grand loch drovenish agus la a vrehenish. So it was dog uh, Donald Monroe a good man. So it is said at the bottom of Loch Drovenish and on Judgment Day. So he wasn't a popular person. So he cared more about the quality and the conditions of his those who were working for him. So we were paid between 30 shillings to 30 guineas a ton, um, these people. So, um, uh, and they were also paid in oatmeal uh, from the mainland. And this was set off against the rents, which were paid in November. So that's it's kind of gives you an idea as uh, how this quiet, what's now qu a quiet place uh, was very, very busy in the 18th century. So again, uh, Going back to experimental archaeology, and uh, you can go and I've given a couple of links at the uh, at the end of this. A couple of talks, Kathy, is to, uh, if you want to go in more about uh, the experimental archaeology we did on Isle Martin last year, 
uh, we learned how, for me, it was really great to learn how filthy this process really is and how smelly and how, why these processing sites are so far away from where people are living. And it was, it was the, the smell is awful. And here's the sound. And it, it's not as deafening here, but in, when we heard all these bladder racks popping, it was just amazing. And then this is the finished product. Um, oops, we go on to that. So some concluding thoughts here. Um, hmm. So here's a little song uh, about the alginates industry at Kyo's, but. So I send Yamin Herne Shorge, so I send Yamin Gufer Hors, so I send Yamin Herne Shorge, O Gufer Lors Neskedenshen. So, for there is gold on these rocks. So, the shores uh, around Scotland's islands and the west coast in particular were known as the, the golden fringe during the boom years of kelping. And, and it continues with new scientific discoveries um, and businesses such as uh, ASCO in Uist and Hebridean seaweed and Ishka in Lewis. This is, this is only a fraction of what I have researched so far, and I still have another couple of years to go. I'm going to write up my thesis. Um, I've still got to visit research Tyree for the iodine phase and Fife for the easy, uh, earliest phase in the 17th century. I, I hope I've given a, a wee um, insight into the impact um, of this industry on our coastal communities in terms of society and uh, societal and economic history. Um, perhaps as you go around the shores with a, you'll go around the shores a new appreciation of what the slimy and sometimes smelly stuff provides. And so here, oops. Here, oh, there's a some kelp burning picture there from Daniel William Daniel. Uh, here's some links uh, as this is going to be uh, recorded. You can be able to to go and have a, a look. And uh, so here's a couple of Kathy Dagg's talks. One of them was for no uh, for no sass and at the Isle Martin Seaweed Festival. If you want to go to learn more about the experimental ar archaeology uh, in depth. And uh, so, and then Topra and Dolchish is where I got one of the recordings. And Hebridean Connections is full of anecdotes and stories of um, the kelp industry. And as well as Tyree's historical center on Eolan. So I hope, I hope that uh, I uh, got something out of this. Uh, and I'll stop there. And for answer, you know, any questions for anybody?